<laughs> Hello. Hi, I'm Mike Gelson, founder of VoiceLessons.com. With me today, we have Dr. Matt <laughs> Edwards. Matt, welcome to the show again. Hi, uh, thanks for having me. Awesome, awesome. Well, as you guys know, this is the hour that we go over your questions. So today we're going to jump into some questions that have come in from audience members like you. So keep those questions coming. All right, first question I have for you. This one comes in from E. Taylor. They write in, what's the world's, what's the world record for sustaining a note? And does it mean you're a good singer if you can hold long notes? So I had to look this one up. I'm going to drop the link in. So anybody watching, you can go watch the world record be set. It was like two minutes and I think one second or something, but it's definitely, it's over two minutes. It's crazy. All right. So that's the world record. The previous world record, I think they said was one minute, 54 seconds. So, uh, but an extremely long time. Uh, I've never met a singer who can do anything close to that. Long as that, was a, that was a vocal note, not like a trumpet or a flute or an instrument, yeah. just a, a vocal singer. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, you know, that's a lot of, uh, you know, it makes sense that somebody would be able to manage their respiratory system that well. I guess that to me, the real trick is it's probably similar to those deep ocean divers who learn how to like resist the urge to take a breath. That almost to me seems like the harder thing. It's fascinating. Uh, but to your, uh, your uh, question on this, which is, does not mean you're a good singer if you can hold long notes? Well, it depends on your style. That's where this really comes down to in genre, right? So if you're trying to sing a genre like classical music, where you have these really long sustained notes or music theater with really long sustained notes, or you write songs and you want epic high sustained notes, then yeah, if you can hold your uh, notes longer, then you would be considered a better singer for that particular rep because that's what you need, right? But I, you know, I've never met a heavy metal singer who's worried about how long they sustain their notes. So in that genre, it probably doesn't matter unless they've written some new song where that's what they want. Uh, Hip hop artists, they don't really worry about sustaining a note. Uh, so again, it doesn't really apply to them. Um, but it, let's assume that you're in one of these genres. Are you, you know, and I'm thinking too like pop singers, like Ariana Grande can hold some things out, Christina Aguilera, Mariah Carey, right? Uh, you know, there's all kinds of artists that do have that ability. So if that's something that you want to cultivate, let's talk a little bit about what's actually happening uh, to make that happen. What uh, we often misunderstand is that we think that it's just the breath. But the reality of it is, is it's the breath in the vocal folds that are really controlling this. You see, the vocal folds, as we've talked about on the show before, they come together. Uh, so here we'll pull out the larynx real quick. So this is the larynx model. The trachea is the air pipe, the windpipe that comes up from the lungs. And then air goes in between the vocal folds, which are right here. And if the vocal folds are open, you can just inhale and exhale. And we don't get any pitch. But in order to get a pitch, these vocal folds have to vibrate together. And as they're vibrating, they are putting some resistance onto the um, air that's coming out. And you can feel what this resistance would be like uh, and model it on yourself by just blowing out through purse slips and then putting a finger to block some of that air. I mean, maybe two fingers and you'll start feeling the air pressure back up. Well, if my fingers are enough to block air coming out of my vocal tract and make me feel that air pressure building up underneath, um, the vocal folds can definitely do it as well. So we always have to think when we're talking about breath support issues about the coordination of the vocal folds with the respiratory system. Now, what's happening in the respiratory system? Well, our lungs are uh, filled with little teeny uh, balloon-like sacs called alveoli, right? There's probably about two to 300 million of them uh, in your body, right? Depending on your size. If you're five foot tall, you're probably closer to the 200 million part. If you're you know, six foot eight, you're probably closer to the 300 million. Uh, of these alveoli. Now these alveoli are uh, have elastic properties, a lot like a balloon does, a latex balloon. So you know if you open or blow up a latex balloon, it's going to want to collapse back in on itself because of the latex being stretched. Well, when you stretch these alveoli, they're going to want to collapse back in as well. And when they collapse back in, they're going to try to propel air up and out of your body. So that's going to have to come out through your lungs, through your vocal tract, etc. So what we as singers are doing is trying to regulate how quickly that air is released and with how much pressure, okay? We do that by controlling the primary muscles of respiration as well as secondary muscles of respiration. 
I'm going to focus on the primary tonight. So the primary muscles of inhalation are going to be the intercostal muscles, which are muscles that run in between your ribs and the diaphragm. Okay? The intercostal muscles, we have external and internal. The external intercostal muscles are what help you inhale. Those start on the bottom edge of each rib, and they insert into the top edge of the rib below. And when they contract, they pull the bottom rib up towards the upper rib. And that helps lift your rib cage up. And your lungs are actually attached to your rib cage through what's called the viscera, uh, or sorry, the pleural sac. The pleural sac is a liquid membrane that helps those lungs attach to that rib cage. So when that rib cage lifts up and out, the lungs get pulled in that direction, which stretches everything and it makes your body want to draw in air. Now, at the same time, the ribs are going up and out. The diaphragm is contracting. It connects down into your lumbar vertebrae. And when it contracts down, it's again attached to the lungs through the pleural sac. And it's going to try to pull them down and that's going to draw air into them. So those two actions are primarily responsible for getting air in your lungs. There are other muscles in your shoulders, back, uh, your pectoral muscles. Those are involved as well. But, uh, you know, to keep it simple, we'll stick to external intercostal muscles, diaphragm. Now, when you exhale, again, if you just let air out, those alveoli, especially in younger singers, they're just going to take care of everything. But if you want to then start to control the way that air is released, you're going to have to pay attention to your abdominal wall and uh, the external intercostal muscles. Because the inside, we have these internal intercostal muscles, and they start on the top of each rib and insert into the bottom edge of the rib above. And when we go to exhale, they're going to try to pull the rib cage down to help pressurize the lungs and to send that air out. We want to try to prevent our body from doing that. And the easiest way to do that is to try to engage these external intercostal muscles by trying to keep your rib cage up and out, buoyant. Now, the key thing here is buoyancy because we don't want to lock the rib cage. It's not going to just stay in one position. We just want to slow its descent, slow the contraction that's coming in, okay? We uh, are going to do that by trying to maintain this upper uh, rib cage through those external intercostal muscles. And we're also going to delay contracting the abdominal wall. Now, your abdominal wall is composed of muscles going in all different directions that create a girdle around your intestines and all the other guts that are inside your stomach. And when we want to accelerate the airflow or increase pressure, we can contract those muscles just like you were doing a crunch. And when you do that, you contract those muscles Well, you have your spine in the back and you have what's called the quadratus lumborum in the back, which is a big muscle, a vertical muscle. It's stiff to hold you upright. You contract those muscles in your stomach. It pushes everything in between uh, the back of your body and the front of your body, and that shoves air up and out of your lungs. And if your vocal folds let it go out, you get more flow. If your vocal folds are in like a belt position, then you're going to get more pressure. So essentially what you're trying to do, E, is if you're working on trying to improve your breath um, control is you're trying to coordinate all those muscular systems. And the easiest way to do this is first just focus on inhalation. So focus on breathing in, getting that rib cage expansion. You are going to have, depending on your body type, some vertical movement. The thinner you are, the more vertical movement that you're going to have. But what we, we don't mind if it goes and expands up here because your lungs come all the way up here, right? So if I feel expansion there, well, that's just my lungs expanding. What we don't want with vertical movement is this. <gasps> Where everything lifts up. That's too much. But you're going to feel expansion here and then expansion in every other direction. You're going to have some expansion downwards, front to back. Okay. It's going to depend how strong your abdominal wall is. If you've got really strong abs, if you've got a six pack or an eight pack, you're not going to feel a lot of abdominal expansion. If you've got no pack like me, you're going to really feel your uh, abdominal cavity move because mine is not that firm. It's not going to hold anything uh, back on its own unless I engage it. Okay. So we're just inhaling, feeling where that goes. Then what I want you to do is to start just sustaining a stream of air on a hiss, just going And as you do that, I want you to just think of relaxing your abdominal wall and your side muscles, your side abs. And I want you to try to keep that rib cage out and just let it come in naturally. And you're going to time yourself and see how long you can do that. And you're going to practice and see how, uh, you know, long, how much longer you can get it going week by week if you're doing that every day for like five minutes. You should see a significant improvement. A lot of singers can get up to 30 seconds with no problem. Then what I want you to do is start doing it on a hum, an eval, a new, just a comfortable pitch, doing the same thing, breathing in, just sustaining everything out and seeing how long you can make it last. After you've mastered that, how to resist the collapse, you're going to add the next step into it. And that's going to be to contract your abdominal wall. Somewhere along the line, when you're holding out that pitch, <coughs> pardon me, 
you're going to notice that the pitch either starts to go down in volume level or it starts to get flat or you start feeling things like tightening up like you're running out of air. At that point in time, we want to crunch the uh, rib cage down and push the abdominal contents, what we call the viscera, that's your intestines, your stomach, all your guts, up into the diaphragm to help propel the rest of the air out of your lungs. To do that, you're going to imagine that you're contracting your abdominal wall like if you were doing a plank. And that inward contraction is enough to push that viscera up into the diaphragm. Those abdominal muscles connect to the rib cage, so they're going to be trying to pull the rib cage down towards the pelvis uh, when you're, uh, you know, contracting into that plank position. And that contraction should take that pitch back up or the volume level back up to where it was. And you're going to continue that contraction, slowly pulling in until you're completely out of air. When you add that next step, you should see your time increase. And then what it's going to be is then a process of you just figuring out how to regulate and balance everything on different pitches. When you do that process of maintaining the expansion, slowly add abdominal contraction, how does that affect your singing when you're in a breathy voice? How does that affect your singing when you're in a belt-like quality? Right? That's the kind of testing you're going to want to do. And through that process, you should start to discover more about your respiratory system, its interaction with the vocal folds. And who knows, if you work on it long enough, you might get up to two minutes. And uh, if you do break the Guinness World Record on that one, please let us know. And we'd love to have you come talk about it. Absolutely. Drop us a link if you guys are coming close to two minutes. Uh, that What a record. So we put the link to the record in the chat. You can take a look at that. Um, but what a breakdown. And certainly we need to have big lungs to get to two minutes. So, all right, let's move to our next one. Um, this one comes in from... Valerie, and uh, she writes in, why do some of my friends say there are three registers when there are only two, right? Good. So Valerie, here's the deal. People have been debating registration since the beginning of singing training. All right. And what registration is, is it's our feeble attempt as musicians to try to categorize and label the sounds that we make. Now, in the classical world of singing, which is where all voice training started, this really made a lot of sense. You knew that you had a baritone and you wanted a certain sound quality out of that baritone. And we knew that that was created with this chest register. And so we wanted to get that working strong, but then we needed a little head mixed in to caress some of these high notes. And you could really solidify into what that balance was and make a lot of sense out of it. Uh, in the contemporary commercial world, we have singers making every sound possible. And while we want them to be able to access these different registers, trying to label them can end up being a, you know, a useless attempt because they're trying to make every sound possible. So two versus three. Well, there's also, if you start looking into the literature, people that label all the way up to 10. Right. So you can really go from two to 10. And then there's some people that just say it's all the same. Well, let's really talk about the man who really started to improve our awareness of what was really happening. And that's Manuel Garcia. I think it was 1855 ish that he stuck a mirror in somebody's mouth, looked down at their vocal folds and saw how they were functioning in different qualities and then started to label name with function. And now what today we look at is in the scientific community, as we talk about like mode one and mode two, our chest and head are thick and thin or pressed and breathy. And they're all variations of the same way of trying to describe the differences between ah and ah. Those are clearly different qualities of voice production made by different mechanical uh, configurations. And that's where the primary two registers come from, chest and head. Okay? Now, if we put uh, electrodes on the side of your neck, uh, what's called an, e, uh, an EGG, okay? electroglottograph. What it does is it sends a small electrical signal. You don't even feel it, but it sends it through your larynx. And what it can do is it can detect when your vocal folds are fully closed, when there's an opening between them, and then when they're fully closed again, and it gives us a percent. And it says in one cycle of vibration, the vocal folds were closed 20% of the time, 80% of the time, anything in between. Okay. We know that when we are in chest voice, that ah, buzzy quality they're on the higher end of closure. We have a higher percentage rate of closure, usually above 50%. We know that when we're in that real breathy quality, uh, we're in a lower percentage of closure. Folk folds maybe close 30% of the time. Okay? But we don't only sing with ah uh, or ah. Uh, we sing with a lot of qualities in between. 
And that's where oftentimes this third register idea comes in, and we call that register mix. Now, in the classical world, you could look at just those three and say, well, we have chess, we have mix, and we have head, and we can make sense out of a lot of singing styles. But in contemporary styles, specifically music theater, we tend to live on one of two, shot, uh, two sides of that middle ground, that mix. We're either living on the chesty side of mix or the heady side of mix, which is why a lot of musical theater teachers talk about four registers. They call those chest, chest dominant mix, head dominant mix, and head. All right. Another teacher equally gifted and another student equally gifted could disagree about what they feel. You could have one student that the teacher and student say, well, that's my chest dominant mix, and then have somebody else over here who says, well, that's just my mix. I don't feel it as chest dominant or head dominant. We as listeners could hear those things as being exactly the same. So who's right? They both are, right? Because it's their personal experience is the same. If you feel four registers, then that's right for you. If you feel three registers over here or two, and you're getting all the sounds you want, that's right for you. Right? What we really just want to remember is that we're describing function. Chest is a thick vocal fold function with a lot of closure. Usually the vocal folds are closed more than 50% of the time in every cycle of vibration. Air comes up from the bottom, it blows the bottom, the vocal folds open, air burst comes through, and then the vocal folds come back together, air burst comes through, vocal folds come together. Right? So those are the cycles of vibration. If they were in a uh, 20% closure, we'd have a little bit of the fold touching, but a lot of it not. And we'd have a lot more time for air to come through. And that's what we use the term head voice to describe. Okay, Head voice is a, a lot of airflow. Uh, chest voice is a lot of buzz. Then we got to decide what to do with the middle. Okay, So for you and whoever you're working with, if you know two is what's working for you, that's fine. But if your friends say there's three and that's working for them, they're not wrong. All right. If you find somebody that even says they feel like they've got five or seven registers and if they've got labels for them and they're clearly different sounds and that way of categorizing those sounds makes sense to them, then they're not wrong either. Right. The only time it's wrong is when you're sitting there going, I, I don't feel any of that. This isn't working for me. And, uh, you know, what do I do? Well, then obviously that that's not for you. That uh, terminology and labeling isn't for you. Um, some people just even call it things not even head or chest. They'll just say, well, this is my breathy voice. This is my buzzy voice. This is my speech-like voice. This is my breathy speechy voice. Or this is my edgy speaky voice. Well, that's five registers that we could label as, you know, chest, chest dominant mix, speech mix, heady dominant mix, and head voice. If that's how they perceive it, fine. All right. They're all feeble attempts by teachers and singers to categorize what they do to explain it to others. So at the end of the day, Valerie, what matters most is that you like the sounds that are coming out of your instrument. You understand how your voice works so you can get those sounds out of your instrument and you're able to replicate it consistently and have a great dialogue with anybody that you're working with. And if you can do that, it doesn't matter how many registers you want to name. If you ever decide to be a teacher, do the homework, though, so you can understand when people come to you saying, I feel this, this or that. And then what I do with my clients is I help them figure out what it is to them. And if I have one client who's like, to me, it's all just mix, fine. Even though I think there's four or five, I'll go with their two or three. Okay. So just remember that if you ever start to teach. Absolutely. I was going to ask you, Matt, what's the, what's the joke that you make about voice teachers in a room have, finding an agreement on these terminologies? Because I think, I, I, are you allowed to say that joke on the air? I, I think I, I'm too very, I'll do the nicer <laughs> one on the air. As I always yeah. say, if you put a bunch of voice teachers in a room and, uh, on this version, I say, tell them they either agree on terminology or starve to death. Two weeks later, you'll have a room full of dead voice teachers. It ain't going to happen. There you have the last one standing who's like, hey, I picked a term. That'll be it. Right? There, there's, it's never going to happen. They've been trying to for like 400 years. We're never all going to agree because it's art. Right? And then subjective. So again, and that's why I was saying what I said to Valerie is at the end of the day, you got to call it what it is for you. You know, you and I like to use the terms chest and head, and we like to talk about, you know, those variations of mix. Um, you know, so yeah, you got to do you, Valerie. But, uh, you know, I think at the end of the day, it's just, again, tie its function. I don't like the mode one, mode two that's coming out of France. I get why they're doing it. I understand their ideas. They want to remove it from that old antiquated idea of head vibrations and chest vibrations. Got it. But saying to a singer, hey, can I get more mode one? Just seems so like just weird to me. 
Um, you know, so I'm old fashioned in that way. But well, like, um, like you said, you know, to each their own, right? So they're, if they're still naming a function. That's just what they're trying to do is just name a function. Sure. So, but we agree there's at least two and yep. then there's more depending on, you know, how you want to name and how many levels of naming you want to get into. So, uh, Valerie, hopefully we didn't confuse you more. We gave you a little, uh, shine a little light on that one. Let's jump into our next question. This one comes in from Jeff. Uh, it's allergy season. So he's, he writes in, I have asthma. Could that be impacting my singing voice? Yeah. Uh, so the answer is yes. Okay, so I've worked with a lot of singers that have asthma. Everyone's different. And I think if you watch the show enough and you hear me talk on here, I'm constantly saying that everyone is different. And that's something that's really important to remember. Your experience with asthma could be very different from someone else's. I've had some singers I've known for a long time and then allergy season hits and they're like, oh, I had to take my inhaler today. And I'm saying, I didn't know you had asthma. Like nothing about their performing made me think that. And I have other singers who are always struggling to get through phrases, struggling with other things that looks like breathing is hard. And I'll say, do you have asthma? And they're saying, yeah. <clears throat> and I can tell. Pardon me. Talking about allergy season. I've got this tickle cough from allergies it's driving me nuts. Um, so the bigger concern, Jeff, is with the, so asthma in its condition as itself, it has its own issues. And so this is where you really need the advice of a medical doctor who can talk to you about any nebulizers that you should be using. Using steam in general is good. Uh, nebulizing saline can be really good as well. But because of the medical condition that you have, you want to make sure that your doctor agrees with one of those things, right? Uh, asthma tends to dry out the airway, so you want to stay real hydrated and make sure that you're constantly drinking water, especially on days that you know you got a gig or you've got a lesson or you're practicing. Uh, you know, if you live in a place that gets really dry and the humidity, if you got a humidity meter, they'll usually show you like the red zone, which is just way too dry, the Goldilocks zone, which is perfect. And then the, you know, too wet zone that will start to grow mold in your room. You don't want that. Um, so, you know, if you get one of those little meters, you can pick them up at most, uh, you know, home improvement stores are like two, three dollars. They're small. Get a check on the humidity in your room. And if it's too dry in certain times of the year, I would get a humidifier and get it in that Goldilocks zone. All right. Because, again, you don't want your airway getting all dried out. The bigger problem that people tend to run into with asthma is the medication that they take. So if you're taking an asthma inhaler, it's spraying a mist that you inhale. And when you inhale it, it has to go over top of your vocal folds to get down into your lungs. And not all of them uh, are created the same, right? They use all different kinds of chemicals. And the chemicals that they put into that mist are different sizes. And they're measuring these things in microns, right? Teeny, teeny units of measurement. But some of the inhalers, there's a difference of almost half. You have some that have the microns that are like half the size of another one. And there are research studies. I did some look into this uh, for another uh, client uh, a couple months ago who was dealing with uh, trying to get the right inhaler. And I said, let me go research through the lit and see if there's any new information. And uh, they're having studies done where they're looking at the differences in sizes of particles. And they're finding that the ones with smaller particles cause less hoarseness, dryness, and vocal quality changes uh, in just normal people. Right. They weren't even trying to look at singers. They were just looking at the average person who has to talk as part of their job and who is having problems with this. So, you know, definitely talk to your doctor about getting the inhaler with the smallest particle size, because that will definitely make a difference. Then you want to make sure that you're rinsing out your mouth anytime you use this inhaler, because you can actually get a, a yeast infection in your vocal tract. All right. They call it candida. And if you get this yeast infection on your vocal tract, it'll actually get onto your vocal folds. And you'll start getting, you'll notice that your voice is getting duller and quieter, right? And it's an easy fix. It's a pill. It's like seven days of a medication and yeast infection goes away and you're back to yourself. But uh, the easiest way to prevent that from happening is to rinse out your mouth after using your inhaler. And if you ever do have that experience where you feel like there's one of the uh, textbooks that I read one time said it feels like a veil is covering your voice. You feel like this it's just getting clothed over slowly and it's getting duller and duller. You may want to go check in with your doctor and make sure you don't have candida starting up. Um, you know, a lot of times you can see it in the mouth thrush. It's white. And, uh, you know, you can look in a mirror and if you see white in the back and you look up what uh, thrush looks like online and you have that, I would go see your doctor. All right. But hopefully those things will help a little bit. Finding, uh, you know, the right treatment, day-to-day -day treatment, and asking about if you can nebulize saline. 
Uh, there are research studies that show that nebulized uh, saline is better than steaming. Uh, a regular family doctor may not know about that research study, but it does exist. Uh, if you run into trouble, just email us and I can send you uh, the paper and then you can use that to ask your doctor about it, what his thoughts or her thoughts are or their thoughts are. Um, then ask about getting the smallest particle size inhaler that you can. Rinse your mouth regularly, stay hydrated and check the uh, uh, you know dryness, the humidity level in whatever uh, your bedroom is where you sleep and make sure that's not in that dry zone. Because if you're only breathing in dry air for eight hours every night, it's gonna bother you. You wanna make sure you're in the Goldilocks zone so you're getting good, uh, you know, humid air to keep your respiratory tract healthy. That's great advice. Okay, some good tips there, Jeff. I hope that helps you out. Let's jump on into our next question. This one comes in from Bruce. Bruce writes in, thanks for the acid reflux info last week. Can you talk more about what we shouldn't eat or drink? Sure. Uh, so let's start this off with just a, a review of the anatomy. Here, let me grab my head. <clears throat> this head over here. Uh, this is the head. And uh, it shows you what's inside your vocal tract. These are the vocal folds that are down here. And that's that trachea that takes us down into your lungs, as I had mentioned earlier. And then it may be kind of hard to see, but there's a little thin little opening right here, all right? It's actually a tube. And that tube is the esophagus. And the problem is, is that the esophagus sits right behind the larynx. So when you drink anything or swallow anything, it does not touch your vocal folds. If it does, you're going to get a tickle cough and you're going to cough it up, okay? This is the epiglottis. It's going to fold back and it's going to make sure that the bolus, whatever you've chewed up and swallow, goes right down into that part of your body. So, if you, you know, hear some singers say, well, don't drink milk before a performance. If it bothers you, then it's bad. It's not touching your vocal folds, though. So if it doesn't bother you, for you, it's okay. There's some singers that swear by lemon tea. Now, you know, or, uh, you know, hot lemon water and, you know, stuff like that. That lemon can help break up mucus that's lining your throat. So if you got a lot of thick drainage, it might help break that up. But it's not touching your vocal folds. It is hitting your stomach, and if you have acid reflux problems, it's probably going to make it worse. So in that instance, you know, you don't want to have a reflux flare up. <clears throat> Since the lemon's not actually touching anything in your voice, it's not really helping, right? It may thin out the mucus, but you can do that with medication. You can just do that by drinking water and getting it thin enough so it clears itself out. So, you know, keep that in mind as then you evaluate other things. Now, we do know that certain things aggravate reflux. And so those are the ones that we really want to, uh, you know, pay attention to. Like I said, uh, lemon uh, and lemon tea, you know, hot lemon water, whatever you want to do with it. I know people like to put it just in their ice water. All of that is going to raise the acidity of the liquid you are drinking. And when that hits your stomach, then that's going to, you know, help keep the acidity higher or lower inside your stomach. We don't want that. Okay. Especially if you're dealing with reflux. Uh, coffee tends to loosen up what's called the upper esophageal sphincter. We have a, you know, a closing at the top of the stomach that keeps food from going up the esophagus when it's not supposed to. We only want food going down, not up. They say that caffeine can weaken the grip of that muscle and make it more likely that you will reflux. So that's why in general you want to avoid coffee. Now, I'm a coffee addict and that's really hard for me. So what I do is I drink low acid coffee. And if you look up Folgers Simply Smooth, it was a total game changer for me. Um, you get used to it. I used to roast my own beans. I like good, high quality coffee. That is not it. But it finally got rid of my acid reflux problems and allowed me to keep drinking coffee. So, you know, with a lot of things out there, there are definitely, um, uh, you know, ways, workarounds and things that you can find. Chocolate can have the same effect as caffeine can. So, you know, unfortunately, again, one of my favorite things, but you got to avoid the chocolate. And especially on both the caffeine and chocolate and caffeine being sodas as well, right? Um, with caffeine and chocolate, you, what you really want to watch for is trying to do it after about 8 p.m. Because the later you get in the evening, the less likely it is to have cleared out of your stomach. And what we really want to watch, as we talked about last week, was food sitting in your stomach when you go to sleep. Because then you are still cranking out acid and it's more likely to go up your esophagus. So that's why we say in general, stop eating and drinking anything other than water two hours before bedtime. Okay. Um, other things is just really in general, anything that would raise the acid level in your stomach, meat, 
is more acidic than uh, greens, right? So eating salad at the end of a meal can help. Uh, eating salad instead, just in general, can help when you're in the middle of a flare-up. Um, they talk about the brat uh, uh, diet, which can be real helpful. So like uh, looking at um, uh, bananas, rice, applesauce, and toast. That's what they uh, you know tell like kids if they're having digestive issues, get them on the brat diet. It'll level things out. I found when I'm having a flare-up, that works really well, uh, you know, to settle it down. Okay. Um, and then what you're going to do is after you've eliminated a lot of these things out, you'll start uh, adding them back in. Spicy foods is another one. If you have spicy foods, it's just destroy your stomach. But let's say if you strip everything down and you end up on like a low carb diet, which is one of the ways that can really help with this. So you're ending up really eating like eggs in the morning. You're having a salad for lunch. And, uh, you know, maybe a salad and maybe a small meat at dinner and your reflux is uh, calmed down. Everything's feeling better. Then you want to start adding in one thing at a time. So then what you might decide is, oh, I really love spaghetti. I'm going to try to have spaghetti this week and try to have spaghetti and then see what happens the rest of the week. You may discover, oh, that didn't bother me at all. Or you may have a flare up. If you have a flare up, then I would continue to avoid spaghetti. If it didn't bother you at all, then you can write it down as one of the uh, foods that's okay for you then try adding in another, right? And then you're going to just figure out the order of things you want to add in. You know, you may want to try to add in that Simply Smooth. You may want to add in one soda a day and see how that does. And pretty soon you'll start to understand what like your balanced place is. Like I know what my balanced place is, how many times a day I can eat and what I can't eat and what I can't. Then I know that like if I go back to my hometown where they have my favorite pizza, favorite donuts and favorite ice cream all within like, you know, a couple miles of my parents' house. I know from many past experiences that I can't do them all in one day. Doing them all in one day ruins me for like a month. But I now know that I can add pizza one day and then I need to take a break the next. Then I can go like hog wild on the donuts for a day and then I need to take a rest, right? And so I can cheat and have the things I still like I just have to let my body recalibrate, tilt it a little bit, recalibrate. But when you just start tilting and tilting towards more acidic and you get a flare up, you're going to be fighting it for a couple of weeks before it calms back down. And you got to strip way back down to whatever your base level diet is, the place that you took yourself to where you're not having problems anymore. All right. So look, Bruce, this is a, a tough thing to deal with. I've dealt with it for 20 years of my life. Uh, so talking from experience, definitely, you know, try to go talk to your doctor, look into getting an upper endoscopy. I'm signed up for mine next Wednesday. Uh, I haven't had one in a while and I want to make sure everything's going okay down there. Uh, you know, you want to watch out for things like uh, there's esophageal uh, growths that can happen when your stomach lining tries to creep its way up your esophagus. It's called Barrett's esophagus. It's bad. You know, you could have an ulcer that's eating away at you and you don't even know it. It's bad and they can treat it easily. And you can get stomach cancer. And if they see bad things happening down there when you're my age, they can stop it. So, you know, don't let acid reflux go on too long. You want to get checked out, uh, you know, by a gastro doctor if this is becoming a regular occurrence. And uh, they just run, they put you to sleep, put a little tube down your throat. They take a look around and then they can tell you what's going on. So uh, hopefully that helps. Awesome. Definitely check out the free pizza and donuts at the end of the show, guys. If you <laughs> I wish. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? Bruce, I hope that helps you out this week. Thanks for tuning in again. Keep the questions coming. So, all right, we got one more question, then I'll check the chat. I think I saw a question in there, so we're coming for you. All right, so this one comes in from Annie, and uh, she writes in, could scoliosis be affecting my breath support? Great question. So in short, the answer is yes. Okay. So when you have scoliosis, what it means is that you have a bend somewhere in your spine. We know that the spine has a normal curve. So it has curves. Uh, it's kind of, I don't have my skeletal model. That would help. But if you're standing sideways, you know, you have the lumbar vertebrae curve in, then your thoracic vertebrae curve up, and then your cervical vertebrae curve forward, and then they level out. So you have that curvature. But then if you're looking at somebody face on, you can start to get little spots where it curves out to one side. So it'll like actually go up, arch out, and then come back and curve in. If it does that, it takes the rib cage with it. And it's going to alter because you got to remember that your ribs connect in the back to the facets on all of those vertebrae, the spinal vertebrae. They connect to the front to a costal cartilage. Well, that costal cartilage is bendable. Back one, it's not bendable. So if, you're, if that spine goes with it, your ribs are going with it. 
and the front's going to compensate. So then you'll see people that have long-term scoliosis that stand like this because their body has just been cut over. And yes, that does affect the way that they breathe. They're not going to feel expansion in 360 degrees of their body. They're going to feel it maybe only on the one side. So when they breathe in, the left expands, but the right doesn't. It's going to give them reduced lung capacity. And, uh, you know, it could be a real thing. So now it depends where your curvature is, how big of a curve it is. Uh, you know, nowadays they really like to go for therapy instead of just trying to put a rod in your spine, which is good. Through the therapy, a lot of people can start to straighten out the curve if they catch it young enough. And so I hope you're, you know, working with your doctor. And if your doctor's suggesting that, please follow through with it because it makes a big difference. People with scoliosis also get a lot of uh, uh, benefit from things like yoga. So yoga is really good for you, trying to stretch and bend and move, right? So start that as like part of your lifelong practice. Or if you don't like yoga, but you're cool with the stretching, figure out the few handful of stretches that do what you need them to do in order to keep your spine as, you know, uh, lined up as possible, okay? And once you can reduce it from an extreme place and start to normalize it a little bit, uh, it's going to be easier to gain control of your respiratory system. And I know plenty of people with scoliosis that is under control who sing really well. All right. Uh, sometimes I notice, sometimes I don't. Uh, you know, you'll notice, again, like one shoulder is a little bit lower. Sometimes the hairstyle or the way somebody dresses will hide it. And then once they point it out, you're like, oh, you know, and you haven't actually really heard it much up until that point. And this is also going to be a bit genre dependent. I mean, an opera singer who's really trying to manage their respiratory system to fill up a hall with no microphone they're going to need bigger breaths than a pop singer is. So an opera singer with scoliosis might really notice it, whereas a pop singer with scoliosis might be like, eh, it doesn't really bother me. Okay? So good luck with that. Continue with, like I said, the medical treatment. Always catching it early and starting early with an intervention is always the best thing. Awesome, awesome. Annie, hopefully that helps you out. Write us back if you have any more questions. Let's jump over to our chat now. Um, Nelson, hey, thanks for tuning in again. I'm going to drop this one in, Matt. Nelson writes in, after singing for a long time, I don't get hoarse, but I do feel tired in my swallowing muscles. Any idea what might cause that? And I wanted to ask you, Matt, can you first kind of explain where are the swallowing muscles and then how do they connect into the voice and maybe break down? Well, let's break out a model here on this one. Okay, awesome. All right, so swallowing muscles. The swallowing muscles lie inside of the larynx. And we have, with everything, you have muscles that are involved that are the primary, secondary, all that, right? So there's lots of muscles that are involved in this. But as you can see, here's the larynx. This is the hyoid bone. And the hyoid bone connects the tongue to the larynx. We have seven muscles that pull this hyoid bone up that help you when you swallow. So we can get like the digastric getting involved. Then we can get the myohyoid that's coming up here from the bottom of the chin and coming into the hyoid bone. That could get involved. Uh, you know, any of these, the amohyoid, which actually runs from your hyoid bone back into your scapula in the back of your body. These things can all be involved with trying to pull your larynx up to help guide food down into your esophagus. To counterbalance those seven muscles, we have three underneath of it to pull it down. Muscles like the sternohyoid bone, which will go from the sternum to the hyoid, uh, or the sternothyroid, which goes from the sternum to the thyroid, okay? So we always have those muscles working uh, in tandem, but sometimes fighting each other. And it sounds like Nelson yours might be fighting themselves a little bit. Now, deeper inside of this, which you can't see on this model, there are also muscles called the constrictor muscles. And these are the ones we often think of when we think about swallowing. We have one that's up around the soft palate, one then that comes down more into the middle of the throat, and another one that comes down here to the larynx itself. Swallowing and singing are very similar to each other, to our brain. Okay, when we go to swallow, we are chewing our food and we start to make a movement in our mouth, which causes the soft palate to lift and the tongue to start to go back, okay, or up, right? Because it usually moves the food up and then takes it back. So that starts to happen as we get ready to swallow, and that sends a signal to our brain to close our vocal folds. Now, anytime you close your vocal folds, any air pressure that's underneath is going to build up and it's going to try to push your larynx up. Well, guess what happens when you swallow? As vocal folds close, air pressure builds up underneath. It helps lift your larynx up. And then your tongue pulls back and drops the food right down into your esophagus. All right? So chew, 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 move tongue, soft palate goes with it. Close vocal folds, air pressure builds up beneath, lift larynx. That's swallowing. Singing. You move your tongue and soft palate to a position necessary to create a vowel. First step of swallowing. 
you close your vocal folds on the pitch that you want and you start releasing a little bit of air, but a lot of times on that onset, we have firm closure. Well, that firm closure means air pressure is building up beneath and air pressure building up beneath is gonna to wanna to lift up the larynx. So vocal folds closing is step two, air pressure underneath building up, step three, right? And then those swallow muscles try to engage as the tongue pulls back and that's where people get stuck, right? Because they're like so far down the swallow train in their brain that their voice is just trying to do the same thing. So what we have to do is really slow down and teach your body that it can make all of those sounds without engaging those swallow muscles, okay? So we'll go through a couple of different ways you can do this. The one thing is, is to look up at the sky and imagine that you're gonna to try to swallow a sword. And in that position, so jaw is gonna to have to drop down and relax and get your tongue out of the way. Then you're gonna sing. Ah. And a lot of people, just that position alone is gonna get these muscles to let go. And I can't tell you how many singers I've done this with in master classes. I've gone, oh my God, that's what open throat is, right? They feel open throat for the first time in their life, okay? There are, I'd say, 15 to 20% of singers who will look up and their, their grabbing is so severe, they're gonna grab as they do the sword swallow. So they're going, ah, and you can hear it, right? So if that happens to you, we gotta take a step back and we gotta play around with the grunt versus the laugh. So what I want you to do is put your fingers on the side of your larynx and I want you to go, 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 go. And then I want you to go, ha, ha, ha. You should notice that when you go, ha, 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 everything gets out of the way. You need a joke to make you laugh. How do you make a tissue dance? You put a little boogie in it. All right, jokes for four-year-olds. But my son thinks it's funny, right? So if that made you laugh, you hopefully felt those constrictor muscles release open and that was very different for you than a grunt. We wanna go for the feeling of a laugh, not a grunt when we're swallowing a sore. So now look up and think of a laugh. Ha 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 Get that opened up and then sing. Ah. If everything feels out of the way, then it's working for you. You're gonna uh, vocalize only in a comfortable range. Once it starts getting hard, come back down. Then what you're gonna do is gonna go from that all the way up, we'll call that 45, right? Then you're gonna split the difference, or sorry, we'll call that 90. So this is up, we'll call this 90. Then what you wanna do is try to bring your head down closer to 45, and then try to bring your head to level. If you can't do 90, 45 level, then you're gonna to have to add two stops along the way, right? One in between 90 and 45, and then one between 45 and level. So you don't go, ah, 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 ah. And if you feel all of a sudden there's a place that has stopped, you want to identify that and then start to figure out how to get from one to the other. So if it's here, ah, 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 I notice, oh, I'm doing something with my jaw there. Ah, ah, now I know what was getting in the way. So now I start just working between those two positions to get the jaw out of the way and get the throat out of the way. That will, that little sequence will, for a lot of times, really help people out, Okay. If that isn't doing it, or if you wanna add the other one to it, is to use your head voice. Because when we're in head voice, we have a lot of exhale going on through the sound. We talked about it earlier in the show that you're at a lower closed quotient. Well, when you get at a lower closed quotient, those swallow muscles aren't gonna be activated as quickly because your brain doesn't associate, ha, ah, with swallowing. So what's gonna happen is a lot of those muscles will chill out. So you're just gonna vocalize real breathy and easy down through your range, making sure that everything stays out of the way. Then if you have a song that you're really working on and it's bothering you, then you're gonna do um, whatever the melody is, breathy. Go on. I love my darling, I hunger for your touch. And take the time as you'll feel like touch, kind of grab. Touch, touch. You can move things around until you find that freedom. So you're just relaxing letting air move through the instrument, and those muscles should start to let go. When you find that freedom, you then wanna to start to edge it back up. So if we're doing hold my love, we're gonna take it up a notch. Hold my love. If I can get that free, take it up a notch. Hold my love. And then if I wanted to press it for some reason, we can take it up the next notch, trying to keep again, all the uh, uh, pharyngeal constrictors and things out of the way. So Nelson, play around with those little tips and tricks. 
Uh, if those don't start to help loosen things up, then it's probably your tongue. And then we can, uh, if you go back into the archives, we got all kinds of things about tongue tension that you can, you know, look at the tongue drills and things to get that out of the way. Um, the other thing that double check on too, Nelson, is make, if you are uh, right now contracting your abdominal wall, try taking a time out from that. Because if you're contracting that abdominal wall as soon as you begin to sing, or if your rib cage is collapsing as soon as you begin to sing, that's going to put a lot of upward pressure underneath your vocal folds. And uh, it's going to increase the likelihood that that swallow of reflex kicks in. So by, you know, adjusting your breath, trying to feel a real low breath and keeping everything, uh, you know, suspended in that inhalation feeling as you begin to sing, that might also help your throat chill out. Awesome. Nelson, hopefully that helps you. Let us know and uh, keep, keep coming. Thanks again for tuning in. Um, Janin. Yes, um, send us a video if you have one, Singing Harmonies. Love to, love to hear that. So uh, let's jump into our next question. Uh, Sharon writes in, um, let's see. What are your favorite exercises for increasing support for people with vocal dysfunction? Sometimes <laughs> with this problem, understand what it feels like to support well, and then other times have difficulty with consistency. Good. So Sharon, one thing is, is that I'm a firm believer in that none of us have all of the answers and when in doubt, refer out. So I do, I'm going to tell you what I do, but Dr. Kari Reagan wrote an amazing book. And in this book, she has got so many um, breathing exercises explained all along the way in ways that, you know, that are functional, talking about what they need to do. And it's an excellent resource. So I would say that this is one book to check out. If you can ever get your hands on the book Respiration and Singers by Thomas Hickson, it's another book to check out. There are some copies of it on Amazon right now. It's the absolute best book written about breathing for singing. Uh, he's a speech language pathologist. And uh, he, I think he did his fellowship at Harvard and then got interested in the respiratory side of the work. And so he went through just tons of literature at the time that he wrote this and documented everything we know and explained it in practical terms and then gave you exercises about what to do with it. So <clears throat> again, you know, just a, a great resource that I highly recommend. Um, and if you, you know, got it in your budget to grab it while it's available on Amazon, do. Um, because it's, it, when it's not available, it'll run $150. Um, Tiffany, the name of that first book was, uh, uh, that was Kari Reagan's book. I think it's a systematic approach to singing. But uh, Dr. Kari, K-A-R-I, and then Reagan. Uh, R, I think hers is R-A-G-A-N. But you should be able to find it over on uh, Amazon, and then you can buy it through the retailer of your choice. Um, so what do I do? So the first thing I do is just start getting them aware of that expansion. And so I do it by having them stand, put their hands on their bottom ribs, and then getting them to breathe in. And allowing everything to do. So nothing that's rocket science. The only thing that I'll add into here that I'll, I think a lot of times people forget is that in that moment, your student is in what is called the cognitive phase of learning. Now, in the cognitive phase of learning, you don't even know that you're not doing the thing. You don't even know how to do the thing. And your body is doing a really terrible job of learning how to do the thing. It's stumbling all over the place. So sometimes I think that Teachers will look at just teaching that one element of breath and they'll think, well, that's only one thing. I need to now add this and this and this and this. And they add six things together at once, which is stand tall, make sure your rib cage expands, feel it in the bottom of your back. Now slowly contract your abs there as you roll it up to here, roll it up to here, and then get the air out and make it spin. And the student's brain just literally can't process that. All right. And if you go and you look at um, uh, uh Dr. Lynn Helding's book that she's got out about the brain components of what we do in our singing. She talks a lot in there about what a brain can actually handle in the learning process versus what it can't. One thing is more than enough for the brain to handle in a lot of our singers. So if they're down at that spot, what I do is just like really slow it down and just say, just go do that this week. Do that this week. And then when they come back. I'm going to say, show me this rib cage expansion. If they're struggling with it, they're still in the cognitive phase. They just don't get it. So then you just got to spend the time doing that. And that's where laying them on, you know, if you have the yoga ball, we can lay them on the yoga ball. We can lay them down with the books on their stomach, have them do that. There's all kinds of different ways to do that, uh, of getting them to feel expansion. Now, if you've got a singer that's got a really firm abdominal wall, you do have to remember they're not going to expand much there. And that's okay. 
I've talked about it on the show before, the um, paper by Jennifer Calgill, where she looked at the respiratory capacities of people breathing really low, breathing in the middle and having some vertical movement. And it was the exact same across all three groups. So it might, you know, you're going to have to rethink some things in the way that they hold really long lyric phrases, if that's the kind of music they sing. But I mean, if they're just doing like fast, quick pop, it doesn't even really matter. So you're going to let them expand where they do. And remember that if they have a tight tummy, then it's going to probably be a little bit more laterally, right? And if they don't, if they have a looser tummy, the ribs will come out, but you may also see some movement down there. So you're going to play with that. Once they start getting that on a consistent basis, then that tells you their brain has connected the dots and they're in the motor learning phase, which means they've got it. You're still going to have to point things out every once in a while, but they get it. Once they've moved into the motor learning phase on keeping the rib cage expanded, then you can add in the next thing. So maybe the next thing is, is, you know, adding that hiss and just trying to resist the collapse. So then you give them that. They're going to stumble through it and they're going to be contracting right away and doing all the things. Uh, if they've got a strong abdominal wall, watch these muscles right here. And a lot of times I have them put their fingers on there and say, do not contract these muscles. Now remember, that's the rectus abdominis, especially that starts right here at the xiphoid process at the bottom of the sternum and connects down to your pubic bone. And if they're used to contracting that thing, as soon as they start to make a sound, it's going to uh, pull in. And remember, it's pulling down on the ribs. So you got to really get them to let go of it and try not to contract it. That's what's hard for them. All right. One of the things you can do is to put them down in sphinx pose. Uh, you know, when you get them down on their arms and then have them arch up and breathe, because then you stretch that muscle. And with that muscle stretch, they'll start to feel what it's like to let it go. You can have them also stretch this way. And they'll feel their side muscles start to let go on where the breath comes in, then go back to trying to have them do uh, the breathing work and see what happens once we've, you know, knocked them out of their default. Because that's the biggest issue is if they're habitually clenching their abs, that's their default position. We got to knock them out of it to really get them to explore something new. When you add that abdominal contraction on top of the ribcage one, don't, you know, forget that the ribcage may go away a little bit. That's okay. That's uh, just their mental processing. They can only handle about three to seven things depending on uh, their ability at a given time. And that may just be enough to knock the ribcage expansion out of the way. We're going to play with it together, though. Get them into the motor learning phase on that. Then maybe start sustaining pitches with it. Then as they start sustaining pitches with it, you're going to make your adjustments and then start doing glides with it. As you do glides with it, you can show them how they're going to maybe have to contract their abs as they go up on certain notes to get through the break. After they get through glides, the next logical step is stepwise motion. One, two, three, four, five, four, three, two, one. Because now you add pitch changing. Again, the brain's now thinking a little bit more. And then you're going to have to deal with that. And then the next thing to teach them on are arpeggios. Because arpeggios are more song-like. And so then as we start to do those arpeggios, they're going to have to do things differently to make it through those longer phrases. Then you're going to want to either give them skips. So having them do an octave jump and then coming down or some other skip pattern that you have. So they learn how to deal with the respiratory system with those skip patterns. And then finally, you want to start building stamina. And I like to just use the traditional nine tone when we're doing stamina exercises. And all it is is doing these nine tones and having them um, sustain as many of them as they can in a row and start making it a, a challenge for them. And, uh, you know, give them like a scoreboard to see how far they can go. And uh, <coughs> I'm not going to make it long with my allergies, but this is what I mean. Uh, how long you can get it to roll and the idea with that is is you're now training them in this super athletic activity that's far beyond anything they're actually going to do in the song so if you're getting them to hit five cycles seven cycles eight cycles and you're going but the tone quality at the end of cycle seven and eight isn't great doesn't matter because they're never going to sing that long in the show so now all of a sudden are in a song so now all of a sudden they bring in a song with a long sustained note and they're looking at three measures and they're like yeah whatever because they're used to doing seven turns all the time in their drills, right? And I think that that's just strategy is that this systematic approach to building up their coordination to handle all of these different tasks that we have to do with our singing voice and songs by building up through that progression, you're going to really be able to get their mind programmed and moving out of that motor learning stage into the automatic stage 
And then in the automatic stage, anytime they work in a song, they've pretty much got it. They got to make decisions, but they're able to just start doing the things. Otherwise, if you're trying to teach it through the song, they're going to get stuck always thinking about those mechanical principles that they're trying to apply in the song, in the moment, and they're going to have a real hard time staying in the storytelling component of the song. So those are my tips. Um, like I said, I think Dr. Reagan has excellent things to say. I think Dr. Hickson has excellent things to say. <coughs> and I'd start there because I just think they're two really strong resources. And, uh, you know, you'll have tons of stuff. They're both just fascinating books. And I think it'll really, uh, you know, kick some fire into your teaching. I always love when I find a good book like Dr. Reagan's is one of the newer books I picked up where you start reading through something like, oh, yeah, I'm going to do that. That makes sense. I get where she's coming from. You know, helps break it up. Absolutely. Thanks for the question, Sharon. I was going to say for me, don't forget staccatos and just yeah. sustaining a simple note. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes can't overlook the easiest ones. So uh, lots of great exercise in there. And uh, Matt, if we can, we can drop in those uh, book links here towards the end. Yeah, we can do it after the show. Awesome. Awesome. So I think that just about wraps up. We got through all of our questions. Um, is there any more questions out there? Going once. Going twice. Okay, everybody. That's an hour for us. So, Matt, any final thoughts? It's summer. Get outside and enjoy it. I mean, you know, I don't know how many more decades we'll be able to say that, but uh, it's beautiful out here in Virginia. I know it's not so beautiful out there in California, is it? No, it's nice. It's only 105 or whatever today's temperature is. So it's definitely going to be warm this summer, and have a great summer, everyone. Yeah. Thank tuning in and we'll see you next week keep your questions coming yep bye thanks for tuning in bye bye